Welcome, esteemed panelists and participants from wherever you may be joining us. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending on where you are. We are very happy to have you to today's webinar that will be discussing the topic, minerals and the energy transition. What, how can Africa leverage the opportunities and its potential in this era? We are joined by panelists, eminent panelists uh, working for different institutions, and, and, and I believe a diverse audience of uh, in the range of 250 participants from different locations, and it's a privilege. Um, today, I'll be the moderator. My name is Gerald Yarugawa. I work with Oxfam as Regional Advisor on Extractive Industries and Fiscal Justice for the Horn, East, and Central Africa region. May I welcome my colleague, um, Chennai Mukumba, to give us the official opening remarks, and we can get started uh, officially. Um, Chennai is... Um, Policy Research and Advocacy Manager at Tax Justice Network Africa. She's based in Nairobi, in Kenya. Um, she is responsible for leading policy units uh, at Tax Justice Network Africa, which includes coordinating the institution's research and policy engagement uh, on tax justice issues at regional and global levels. Um, Chennai, you're welcome to speak to us. Thank you so much, Gerald. Thank you so much for the introduction. So I'd like to welcome all of you to the seventh webinar in the ongoing Road to COP27 series that's being organized by Tax Justice Network Africa, Publish What You Pay, Oxfam, NRGI, PowerShift Africa, as well as Econews. African countries have found themselves at an interesting intersection within this climate change conversation, which is why spaces such as this are so important. African countries are facing some of the worst impacts of climate change yet contributing so little to its causes. And they also find themselves in a position where the rich endowment of minerals that are critical to the transition to clean energy reside within their borders. And this has huge potential opportunities to benefit the continent. This placement means that there are significant risks as well as opportunities for the continent as we're discussing this road to COP27. Countries across the globe are pursuing zero emission goals, which has created an incredible demand for critical minerals such as cobalt, copper, and lithium. These are essential components in producing renewable energy technology, from electrical vehicle batteries to wind turbine blades. 70% of the world's cobalt that's used for batteries and mobile phones to electric cars comes from the Democratic Republic of Congo, and a significant percentage from Madagascar, as well as countries such as Zimbabwe and Namibia, all of these having various uh, minerals, including lithium. The global demand for rare earth elements, a subset of critical of minerals, is expected to increase from over 200,000 metric tons in 2019 to a forecasted 304,678 metric tons by 2025. As this global demand rises and the rush for these minerals by corporates from rich countries heightens the importance of positioning African countries to create a level playing field cannot be understated. This is so necessary to enable African countries and their populations, particularly those that are being most negatively impacted by their extraction to also benefit socially and economically from their own resources. Africa has always been the source of materials that are necessary for global progress. This time, however, we must be thinking about how to position ourselves so that we don't find ourselves riddled by the resource curse, whereby this renewed demand for critical minerals is pushing us further into poverty and inequality, exacerbating environmental degradation, health and safety risks, as well as facilitating corporate tax abuse. Rather, we should be equip equipping ourselves to benefit from the finance and technology which is necessary for the needs of our citizens, who, as I mentioned earlier, suffer the most from the risks of climate change. In addition to this, we also need to be thinking about how to move up value chains through mineral value addition, so that we don't find ourselves only exporting raw materials, but figure out how to build our capacity in this regard. We also need to be thinking about negotiating better contracts within these different sectors. All this is key to achieving long-term social and economic transformation from the extractive sector as is stipulated by the Africa Mining Vision. So with these brief remarks, I am excited to welcome you to the session within this webinar series, which is going to highlight the impact of climate change and the energy transition on mining, focusing on future critical minerals in the global supply chain and the path to clean energy 
and net zero, as well as assess how well we can position Africa within this conversation and leverage off this upsurge in demand for critical minerals. On behalf of the different organizers of this webinar, I'd like to welcome you once again and wish you all a fruitful and engaging webinar. Thanks, Gerald. Thank you, thank you so much. And I, you have put it very well, the fact that Africa should not remain an exporter of raw materials and needs to move up the value chain in terms of the technologies. Very good and insightful um, point as they are pointing us into the, the nature of the discussion that we are having today. Um, colleagues, just to remind you that this conversation is also available on our social media platforms. On Twitter, you can follow the hashtag Road to COP27. Um, and if you have any questions and comments, put, please put them on chat and the panelists will be able to respond to them. May I, at this point in time, invite um, our colleague, Mr. Thomas Schofield. Um, he is the Africa Senior Economist, Economic Analyst at uh, Natural Resources Governance Institute. In his current position, Thomas supports economic policy and work across Africa, including in taxation, revenue management, and other linkages between the extractive industries and the economy. Before this, um, he is an, an experienced uh, author and uh, in his latest work, he has been focusing on energy transition and its implications on the African continent. He has robust knowledge of the extractive industry economic terrain, particularly in the countries of Africa, such as Tanzania, Ghana, Nigeria, and Uganda. Thomas, what are the key findings from your research, from the many years of work on Africa, what are the key findings that you would like to share with us in terms of how Africa could leverage its potential uh, in the critical mineral subsector in this era of the energy transition? Thanks, Gerald, for that uh, kind introduction um, and the, the really important question. And before I before I answer it, just would like to say hello to everyone and. Yeah, thank you for uh, involving me in this, in this very important discussion. Um, so I want to deliver, I think, three key messages uh, in this webinar um, based on the work we, we are doing at, at NRGI in this area. One is that Africa really does have a unique opportunity in the next 30 years, given its huge mineral reserves. Um, two, good governance is needed to take advantage of this, but actually it doesn't require reinventing the, the wheel. Um, tax and local content continue to offer large uh, potential benefits. And then three, if Africa is going to try and establish value chains, uh, go downstream, uh, regional, regional coordination is going to be, going to be key. Um, so I guess I'll start just by um, setting out why we think this is a unique opportunity for, for Africa. Um, as Chennai alluded to in, the, in her opening remarks, um, the energy transition is going to result in a huge increase in uh, demand for, for minerals. The energy transition is essentially um, a switch from fossil fuels to, to metals. Um, we're moving from a system that um, that operates, that depends on fossil fuels, the one that, that doesn't. Um, and that is really going to need a, an industrial revolution, uh, an industrial revolution that needs metal and, and a lot of it. Um, so just to um, maybe go a little bit into a little bit more detail on the, um, on sort of what sort of boom we're talking about and for which metals, I just want to share a, a slide. Um, if I can find it here. So there are a few minerals that are, are grabbing um, most of the most of the headlines. Um, you know, cobalt, lithium, and this this table shows shows why. Um, lithium, as you can see. Um, because it's such a key component of batteries, um, could see demand increase by 2,421% um, by 2050, by, by some estimates. Um, then you've got uh, the rare earth metal neodymium um, that could go from uh, basically having very little demand now to significant demand in the, in the future. But actually, 
as you can see from this, this table, um, copper also has huge potential um, demand growth, not in terms of the percentage growth rates, um, because copper is already uh, demanded for, for lots of different lots of different uses. But when you look at the, the volumes that will be demanded going forward, um, that's going to see a massive increase. And actually, demand for copper is actually going to be greater than the demand for all other critical minerals combined by some, some estimates. And so even though cobalt and lithium prices are higher than copper prices, um, copper actually probably will generate even greater value uh, over the next few decades than those, those minerals that are going to get the, that, that are getting the, the headlines. Um, as you can see from the, from the table, um, at today's prices, um, copper demand could be worth about $405 billion uh, in 2050. So even if an African country gets just a, a slice of that, that sort of uh, amount, it could be trans transformational. Um, but I'm just going to stop sharing my screen now. I've just got two or three slides that I want to bring up at various points. I hope that's not too, too disruptive. Um, but so there's going to be huge demand growth uh, across a range, of, a range of minerals. But actually, that demand isn't going to, to last forever. Um, another big difference between uh, the energy system of today and the energy system of the future is that whereas today the system requires a con continuous supply of fossil fuels, that system in the future, once it's been built, isn't going to need that much more, more metal. Um, and if you look at the net zero targets um, that, have, that have been um, set out by various countries across the world, about 64% um, of the world is looking to achieve net zero by 2050. China is looking to achieve it by 2060. So really, we're talking about probably the next 30 years um, being the, uh, the window for, um, for countries and, and Africa to, to benefit from this boom which sounds like a, a long time. Um, but actually, if you look back over the last commodity boom, that was about two decades long. Um, countries did benefit from it, but, but a lot of countries that did have significant mining activity during that time um, still have a lot of uh, economic problems today. Um, but it is an opportunity for Africa. Um, Chennai has already sort of set out um, some of the, well, the the, the, um, the, the huge reserves that, that a lot of Af African countries countries have. I'll just bring up uh, another slide just to to kind of concrete concretize that a little bit more. Um, but there's huge huge reserves in in large uh, in a large range of minerals. Um, across the African continent and in, and in specific countries. This is from some, some research we're doing at the moment where we're trying to map uh, Africa's mineral potential uh, using data from SMP and US Geological Survey. Um, and this map shows some of where, where some of the largest reserves are with the, the darker shade of orange being uh, representing sort of a larger global share of, of reserves. And I think to put that into perspective, um, it's, it's useful to compare that to Africa's share of, of oil and gas. Um, and just looking at production today, um, Africa contributes around 8% of the world's oil and gas. Whereas when it comes to uh, mineral production, uh, it already produces the most, um, most of the world's cobalt, tantalum, platinum, Manganese, uh, to, to name but a, but a few, um, so huge potential. And given the the pace of the uh, energy transition relies on getting metals out of the, the ground quickly, um, Africa uh, has significant power right now. Um, but it does need to wield that power quite carefully. Um, it needs to convince the world that it can supply um, minerals to, to the energy transition in a timely and, and stable way. Um, 
the average time to get from discovery to production uh, for non-gold mines is around 16 years. Um, and that's been found to be longer uh, in countries with low income um, and weaker governance. So Africa needs to show that it can reduce those, those lead times. Otherwise it does risk investors fearing that they will miss the boom, boom if they invest in Africa and, and going elsewhere. Um, and there's also a risk for specific uh, minerals, um, minerals that um, have, um, have very few uses uh, and are concentrated in some of the, sort of the, the high risk countries, um, cobalt and the DRC being, being the obvious example where um, because of the risk of supply disruption, um, battery manufacturers are already reducing the use of cobalt in their, in their batteries. But on the flip side, if Africa can um, prove that it can uh, deliver minerals in a timely and, 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 and stable way, then um, it could see its diplomatic power increase significantly. We all know how important, how powerful Saudi Arabia is with its oil and Russia with its gas. Um, but also it could maybe access other climate finance opportunities, given the importance of a fast transition for averting climate disaster. Um, but good governance is going to be important for um, Africa to uh, benefit in other ways, in other ways too. Um, so I'd say the three main benefit streams are taxing miners, supplying miners, and then making stuff from the, from the metals. Um, when it comes to taxing miners, there's an understandable concern that, um, that Africa has lost a lot of revenue as a result of tax avoidance over, over previous mining booms. Um, and that really needs to be looked at um, closely, but I think uh, taxation still um, could provide one of the largest benefit streams uh, when it comes to, comes to the next metal boom. If, um, if steps are taken to boost administrative capacity, but also to then manage those revenues carefully. Um, then when it comes to supplying, uh, supplying miners, local content, um, again, a huge opportunity for Africa. You look at the biggest mining countries in the, in the world, Australia, Canada, um, actually they generate more GDP and jobs from their suppliers than from the mining activities themselves. So again, sort of re-looking at Africa's approach to local content and figuring out from the lessons in the past what can be improved there. And then finally, uh, making stuff from, from the minerals, establishing value streams down, uh, uh, value chains downstream. Um, this is you know, the, the big increase in, in interest in transition minerals and the products that, it, um, that can be manufactured from them has understandably reinforced uh, Africa's ambitions to establish value chains down, downstream. Um, but that brings me to my third and final key message around regional cooperation. Um, I mean, regional cooperation would, will be important for, um, for benefiting in any of the ways that I've just set out. But I think um, particularly for uh, establishing value chains and, um, and given the, the focus on, uh, on that uh, benefit stream, I think it makes sense to me maybe to just spend a couple of minutes talking through, through that um, and maybe just putting up my final slide as well. Um, so, so as this, this map shows, um, it's showing reserves of, of the different sort of components of, of or the key components of, of uh, batteries. Um, and then also um, an index of above ground assets that we've developed from different sources. So that's looking at a country's power and transport infrastructure, local content potential, uh, wider investment environment. Um, with the with the darker green showing more above ground assets and and uh, the lighter green showing showing less, um, so I think regional 
cooperation and coordination is important for four reasons. One, as this map shows, uh, no country has all the metals needed for batteries. Uh, two, the countries that have many of these metals actually have fewer of the above ground ass assets that will be needed to uh, establish downstream industries. Um, three, none of these countries on their own have the large markets that would support um, economies of scale, scale and sort of big, um, big battery sort of uh, manufacturers to bring down costs. Uh, and then fourth, research and development will be, will be key um, for both um, keeping up with new technologies and making sure they make sense for the African context, but also exploring new, new technologies specific to, to Africa. Um, and that would be most efficiently done if, it, if there was one common fund across the, across the region. And there have been promising moves um, when it comes to regional coordination uh, in, recent, in recent months and years. Seen recently the DRC Zambia MOU uh, around cooperation around batteries. Uh, SADC is uh, in the process of developing a regional mining vision. Uh, but it will be challenging. And just very quickly, two of the, the two key challenges that we're currently exploring. Um, one, everyone has to agree what the, the region is actually going to make. Um, otherwise, the, there's the potential for different parts of the value chain to be incompatible. So um, will it be batteries for two wheelers and three wheelers, batteries for cars, batteries for, for power storage? So that all needs to be figured out. And then second, um, it's inevitable with regional uh, coordination that um, some countries will, um, will get more of the activity than, than others. Um, and actually, you know, there's a risk that some of the, the least capacitated countries in the region won't benefit at all. Um, so to reduce the, the risk of um, some of those countries blocking a regional agreement, uh, mechanisms need to be developed to, to get around that, make sure ev every country has something to gain. Um, but yeah, regional value chains will be, um, will be challenging to establish, but I think it makes sense for Africa to be, to be trying to do that. But it's also important not to lose sight of those other benefit streams because they will also be really important. Um, and with that, I will uh, stop there. Apologies for going a couple of minutes over um, and I'll, I'll hand it back to, to you, Gerald. Thank you. Thank you so much, Thomas, um, taking us through um, all the recommendations around body chains, the importance of good governance, and of course, regional coordination. Later um, in the discussion, we'll be talking to Dr. Marie, perhaps uh, more about the regional co co cooperation component of the submissions, and perhaps we'll see some, you know, some other strategic priorities that Africa can, can, can undertake to make sure that we harness the potential of our critical mineral subsector. I got a little bit worried. Of course, you talked about you know, opportunities from value chains, from being a supplier of the critical minerals as well. One of the concerns um, that comes through, even I think in the charts today, is um, how do we avoid a repeat of the past where Africa is an exporter of the raw materials and not benefiting sufficiently from a value chain? You did indicate the pace of the energy transition and the, the fact that it takes about 16 years um, you know, to develop a mine and you know, supply the materials that are needed. There's a fear, Latin fear, that Africa could be an exporter of raw materials again and miss out on the full potential um, of the energy transition. Um, and, and I think Chennai you didn't get on the importance of moving up the value chains and not just being a supplier of, of materials. Of course, Thomas, you talked about the opportunities across the value chain, uh, but yeah, I think that's one of the issues that keep um, at the back of our minds. How do we this time take advantage of the value chain rather than just supply materials that are needed for the value chain, which as we know, uh, most of the money, most of the resources come from the, 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 these resources are up the value chain uh, and not at the stage of supplying the materials. But we hope to have more of this discussion um, in the call, perhaps in the next round when you have a chance, Thomas, to make more comments. Moving from an Africa, to zero in down now to a specific example of one of the countries in Africa that are big on mining, Tanzania. Um, 
we will now look at um, you know, specific examples for Tanzania, specific research that's been conducted in Tanzania, scoping research on Tanzania's potential um, in the critical mineral subsector and what the implications are and perhaps what Tanzania needs to do to harness its own critical mineral subsector. And who, who else are best placed to discuss this topic other than Dr. Peter Kafumu? Dr. Peter Kafumu has been a, a bureaucrat um, in the Ministry of Mines in Tanzania, having been a commissioner for minerals um, in the government. He also served as a senior most geologist and technical lead um, advising the government of Tanzania on minerals. He's a former member of parliament, so he's been a politician as well for Tabora constituency, currently an independent consultant, where he still advises government of Tanzania um, and the private companies, civil society organizations, and international bodies and extractive industries. So Peter, what is it that you have established from the scoping study you've done in Tanzania as an example, um, just to dig a bit into the details? What's, where are the opportunities? What are the implications? And how could Tanzania harness its critical mineral subsector um, in the next uh, 10 to 15 minutes? Would you kindly of take us through uh, that study? Yeah, thank you very much uh, for inviting me for, to talk on this. Uh, my talk is, uh, as you have said, is based on what I, I did as a scoping study, looking at the critical minerals in Tanzania. But also I have looked at some of the literature on what other countries are doing. And to my amazement, I see Africa is not actually involved in this. All countries look at most of the uh, their policies and laws. They don't even talk about critical minerals. Uh, in South Africa, there's a bit of talk there now, decarbonizing the, 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 the power system of South Africa, but there are still no plans, no laws, no policies. You know? Uh, in Tanzania, it's the same. Uh, we, we, nobody knows about this thing, you know. So Africa is very far from this. We are talking about uh, decarbonizing, but the, the African countries themselves, in their plans, they are not talking on, on that. So I'll give this example of Tanzania, which is a typical example of all other countries. They have the potential, they have the minerals, but they don't plan to, to use them. So I'll try to share my some of my... Uh, you see that one? Yes, yes, please. I, I can see a screen. Please go right ahead. Mm -hmm. So this is, is, is a long presentation, but I'll, I'll, I'll bear on a few slides at the end of this presentation. I'm not going to bother you with all those uh, other things. So this uh, climate change thing, uh, the definitions is not important. So I'm going to, to the Tanzanian case uh, where we, as a country, maybe I start with, This slide is good because we, it shows how Tanzania has fared in, in terms of uh, prospecting and, and, and finding critical minerals. In the 2000, 2005, uh, all the licenses, percentage of licenses which were given to investors were on gold. But by 2020, the licenses by percentage were about 70% are now in, in, in critical minerals. So this is... Uh, a clear example that uh, critical minerals are so important now in the world world market in the, in the world mineral chain value chain uh, the other maybe I, I can show this one you see i was talking of south africa they, they had a, a, a report the national business initiative report in which they uh, they, they started a dialogue on how to, to, to decarbonize the, the, the system, the power system of South Africa. But uh, there is no any law, any policy about this. It's only uh, trying to, to, to dialogue on this. In Zimbabwe, in 2013, they had a, a draft mineral policy which mentioned critical minerals, but uh, 
uh, there is neither neither any good progress in there. In Tanzania, this what I, I will discuss the scoping study by N, NRGI, and we see the continued dialogue now, which we are the N, NRGI is 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 involving the, the people in Tanzania to 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 at least start talking about uh, energy transition. In Uganda, they they, they had the mining policy. Uh, it is stated. It is stated some of the. They said strategic minerals, but they they, they don't even recognize uh, critical minerals. So the Tanzania, this is an opportunity for Tanzania because uh, if you look at the, the the deposits, we have graphite, which is 18 million tons, and is is ranked fifth in the world reserves. Nickel is available, uranium is also there. So Tanzania as a nation needs to partake in this. And my scoping study is being used as a, a lobbying instrument to make Tanzania, Tanzanian government to recognize this and try to, to make some changes. So the critical minerals of Tanzania, that is not important. We have projects which are about, uh, 11 projects which are already in Tanzania on, on critical minerals and two mines already of copper. Um, we have players in the critical minerals in Tanzania, 38 of them. We have 19 uh, companies from Australia and one from Canada, United Kingdom, four, and US one, Tanzanian company, five, and a joint venture. The, the government has a joint venture with companies, six of those. So at 38 the, the companies or projects are working in Tanzania, currently working in Tanzania. But with all this, there is no emphasis whatsoever on critical minerals in the policy, even in the laws. So the participation, Government participation is few projects which the government is working with companies. Uh, those are the joint ventures, not important to mention, there are six of them. Now, let me go into the analysis which I did on the national development plans. There are three of them national development, yeah, the one. Five year development plan one, two, three. All of this, if you look in, in them, you don't find any, any insistence on, 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 on energy transition. But also, they mention on one project, which is titanium and vanadium, and call it a flag, a flag, flagship project. But in essence, there is no emphasis on, on in, in the development plans on decarbonizing or even on the energy transition. The mineral policy is also very mum, doesn't say anything on critical minerals, but it only says uh, participate strategically in investments. So strategically might, might mean also the critical minerals. The energy policy is the same, it's, it's very quiet. It just mentioned the, uh, the, 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 the technologies, but it, there is no specific mention of energy transition, even uh, the law to, 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 and to, uh, to take that on board. So Africa is, in Tanzania, for example, is, partic is participating in the COP, COP since 1992 to, to, COP 20, to COP 26. But you go back to the, their countries, you don't have any, any plans on that. So it is quite a uh, uh, bad situation. So the policy also is very un, uh, very uh, quiet on, on critical minerals and, and, and so on. So the, the mining code mentions them, it defines them, but it doesn't give any specific plans and, and priority on, on how to, 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 to participate in this global effort of energy transition and the use of critical minerals. 
So registration in the energy sector is also mum. So let me go to my messages, my conclusions, and, and see. As I said, these plans, they are very, they don't mention anything on, on critical minerals, neither the energy transition in Tanzania. And this is typical for many countries in Africa. We may talk of Africa moving to, to, to clean energy, but without any plans, it's gonna happen. Uh, the policies, as I said, are also uh, very quiet, insensitive to climate change and energy transition. The regulatory frameworks in Tanzania also uh, very quiet. The government engagement, well, is the same, it doesn't engage really in the energy transition. So what is the way forward as I, 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 I finish my presentation? This is the question, how can the government of Tanzania participate in this global effort, energy transition? Why are we reaping maximum benefits from critical minerals, resources for the country and her people? So this is the question. And my answers is a dialogue among government, legislative, legislature, civil service society, and various communities on this. And this, we have started it uh, with the, the, the Natural Resources Governance Institute to, to talk to, to uh, the other time I, had, I, I went to the, uh, the parliament to have a, a workshop with the, it was, what is in the workshop? It was a presentation with the, uh, the committee, mineral, uh, mining and mineral committee of, 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 of the parliament of Tanzania. So the second thing is we must align the statutes and the policies. We need to lobby, to lobby the government so that they can really try to participate. Otherwise it will be all talk. And the other one, we have to enhance the use of energy, uh, new, the use of new energy or clean energy in rural communities and also in Tanzania, we have a lot of small scale mining activities that we need to uh, incentivize them so that they can use this. And this one will, will, will expand the critical mass base for local content. I mean that the uh, company would, would, would decide to, to bring, to build a, a solar panel farm because there is market. So we need to enhance this in, in this country. And also we need to look companies uh, to, to, to invest in, in energy transition uh, infrastructure that uses critical minerals. The last one is to build uh, skills for saving this, uh, uh, this industry. Otherwise, Africa won't, if you don't build the, the, the necessary skills, uh, the local content won't, won't have enough. It will be externally based. Uh, maybe I end up there. I'm sorry for rushing, but finally, I would say Africa needs to participate in this, uh, uh, in this activity, but it is not prepared. It isn't, isn't even there, you know? No laws, no plans, nothing. So we, we as uh, uh, people, we need to lobby governments. We need to help governments to, to look at this thing as a serious thing. Because uh, come 2050, uh, if the, 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 the best, the, the first world has decarbonized and we are still uh, mumbling, we will be in, in big trouble. Sante Sana, you're all welcome. Thank you so much, Dr. Kafumu, for those insightful uh, remarks and the presentation in Tanzania, for a moment, when you talked about uh, 11 projects on critical minerals in the country, um, the two copper mines, a number of joint ventures and international companies working in Tanzania, I thought, oh, Tanzania is ready to benefit from the critical minerals uh, subsector until you started talking about the policy, the absence of uh, you know, recognition of critical minerals in the policy and legal framework. Yes. Um, is it a fair um, assertion to say 
work is progressing in Tanzania, but the policy framework is insufficient to cover even those uh, projects that are already going on. Is 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 are these projects going on in the shadows? In one yeah, it is fair to say that the projects are there, but they are considered as any other minerals like gold and so on. So uh, these minerals are extracted for export, you know, and and. So I, I, Tanzania is gonna is, is is bound to lose in this. If they have the policy and the laws, they would they negotiate some uh, uh, contracts which are really inviting companies maybe to invest in battery uh, production. All right. Actually, right. Tanzania or, or in, in invest making wind turbines. You can use those minerals and those with turbines in Tanzania. You don't have to export copper if you have a wind turbine here, here in Tanzania. We just uh, make a, an industry which will process the copper and you use it directly in Tanzania. So that's what I, I meant. Wonderful, wonderful. Thank you, Dr. Kafumu. And um, you may stop sharing the screen now. Um, we'll go to our final panelists. To no, last but not least, uh, in terms of the panelists' uh, presentations. Um, Dr. Marek Kitao, you have had um, presentations from all the other panelists talking about the need for regional cooperation. One of those that stood out for me. Um, you also have vast experience working um, in, on the African continent. Um, so I, I'm sure that you have uh, taken in some of these comments to inform your own submissions. Um, our participants, Dr. Marit um, is uh, the interim director now at the Africa Minerals Development Center which is a specialized agency of the African Union and the Pan-African Center dedicated to harnessing Africans' minerals uh, resources for sustainable development and transformation. Previously, she worked with the United Nations Economic Commission for Africa, where she has, was a strong advocate of developmental and sustainable mining in the continent. She also previously worked as a technical advisor on extractive industries uh, for sustainable development at the United Nations Development um, uh, Program in Mozambique. Marit, having listened to the submissions from their panelists and also from your knowledge of the landscape for mining uh, in Africa, um, what would you be, what, what you, would you share as your key insights and policy recommendations on what Africa needs to do to leverage its potential in the critical mineral subsector in, in view of the energy transition? Thank you very much, uh, Gerald, and uh, good morning, good afternoon, everyone. Um, thank you for the organizers for inviting the African Minerals Development Center, which, as Gerald mentioned, is a pan African center dedicated to harnessing Africa's mineral resources for sustainable and structural transformation. So I, I really liked how uh, Chennai framed the, the problem at the beginning, and uh, she almost uh, uh, almost said everything that you know the uh, our center is dedicated to do. And uh, although I don't like the term resource curse, but uh, uh, actually that's why, what, what we are here to avoid. And so um, hearing um, all other, uh, other speakers as well, talking about uh, green minerals, I call them green minerals for a reason. Uh, they're critical for, for uh, the others. They're critical because they're rare and they need them for their um, energy transition and for their, um, for their also for other uh, more strategic issues. So for us, they are strategic and green. For them, they are critical. Perhaps just to come to the Tanzanian presentation, perhaps that's why you don't see the word critical in our policy submissions. But uh, uh, just to say that uh, that doesn't mean that uh, they, were, they, are, they are overlooked. They were overlooked in the past, but it's just to say that for us in Africa, we frame them as green minerals or strategic minerals, because we have them, the rarity and the criticality is not, not for African countries. Um, so my submission would be, just to be uh, brief, uh, because our, our center, which is, um, it has been in existence for since, to, since 2013 as a project at the ECA, but now it has graduated to, it has graduated or transferred to the African Union. So we are fairly new, uh, around two months old, but we plan to work on uh, several issues uh, on policy and governance on, in, on minerals for industrialization. And also uh, 
about enhancing geological and mining information systems. I was struck that uh, Thomas, when he presented, he, uh, he had very good uh, graphs, but his sources of information were US Geological Survey and others. How, why don't we have our own geological uh, surveys and how, why don't we have our own uh, mining information systems? And another one that we're working on as well is the minerals classification, Africa's minerals classification through UMBREC to know the real value of our minerals. That includes also green minerals, but others as well. So my submission is that for us to really structurally transform for our minerals, it's not, we cannot just do, I mean, it's important to do taxation and mineral revenue. And I know Th Thomas mentioned it, but that's not enough for structural transformation. We really need to focus on the value addition, the linkages and the industrialization and the manufacturing parts of it. And that's the lesson that we are learning from the past. Of course, revenue is important, but it's, it's not enough to initiate. And as he mentioned as well, there's tax avoidance, illicit financial flows. And so we really need, and that's the biggest uh, input for the Africa mining vision is the linkages part that makes it out, uh, different from other, other um, uh, visions is that we really need to emphasize on this uh, uh, value addition, local content suppliers uh, part of, of uh, issue. So my, my basic key um, recommendation or key message would be that uh, mineral rich African countries can use this big opportunity. I don't want to go into the numbers because it's already mentioned. Mention um, the opportunities available within the lithium, I'll be very specific, green minerals, but also the lithium iron battery manufacturing value chain very specific, to begin their trajectory towards becoming manufacturing-based economies. That's how structural, structural transformation happens. And what needs, the second message that I want to, what needs to happen? There was a recently a Bloomberg study that was commissioned by uh, African um, institutions such as the uh, United Nations Economic Commission for Africa, Africa Bank, African Development Bank, African Finance Corporation, that came out with a study on the costs of producing battery precursor. Uh, it's not the battery itself, but the battery precursor in DRC. And it, that finding is clear. It says that you know, it's, there's cost and emissions ad advantage to having a precursor plant in DRC. So it can be done. It's not hypothetical, it's not risky or whatever usually the excuses that are given. It makes business sense and emission sense, so both. So, what we really need is ambitious industrial policies within our own continent. We have to be bold and ambitious and not just say, oh, we can't do it because we, can, we have demonstrated that it can be done and it makes sense. So bold industrialization policies are what is required. The second one related to that is to be bold, you have to have strong political will and commitment from governments. And that's where the regional harmonization comes in. There's a lot of momentum around the Africa free trade uh, agreement. Um, and so that can be leveraged to have this regional dimension and the cooperation that was um, alluded to. Thomas was showing us all the, all the uh, strategic green minerals that are available, lithium in Zimbabwe, cobalt in DRC, nickel in uh, Tanzania, graphite also in Tanzania, Madagascar, uh, graphite in Mozambique, all of them, they don't belong in one country. So there has to be a regional cooperation. And for that, again, there has to be strong political commitment, but also at the regional level, we really need to be together. That's what is uh, absolutely needed. And there, are, as, uh, as mentioned, there's a, this DRC Zambia alignment is a, a good one. We, are hope, we hope that Tanzania, since Tanzania is represented, could be also part of it um, and others as well in the region, but also you know, uh, on the other region, there re really needs to be a regional cooperation if you really want to make impact and think about economies of scale. And the other message is that it has to be done now. There's, we don't have time, you know, there's a race to finding alternatives to cobalt, to others. So it, there's a, a sense of urgency there. So that's why, um, you know, of course, uh, mineral policies can be changed, reforms can be changed, but what are we doing on the ground? And some practical uh, examples of this kind uh, that I mentioned in the DRC are one of those bold uh, initiatives that need to be done. 
on the more practical uh, terms, and I and I, uh, I uh, my colleague from Tanzania mentioned, there needs to be a skills revolution around this because we really need the skills and the capacity to undertake that throughout the, the value chain, uh, and also investments in research and development and innovation. Why are we going to the to do to the West to acquire this? Is because first we don't have the capital, but we don't have the knowledge and know-how. So we really need to invest in the research, in the skills. Uh, so that you know we act actively um, do it in our continent. Uh, that's the main uh, issue that for us that we can't uh, other than the others. And the final point I want to make is that um, we are developing with African Development Bank uh, is is developing, uh, and also we are contributing to an Africa Green Mineral Strategy uh, to come. Uh, and so that strategy will be uh, we are looking into how we all can all African countries who have, uh, you know, green minerals. Yeah, I, I saw the, the classification at the beginning uh, uh, from Thomas, I think. Uh, all of these are present in Africa. So what is our strategy? We cannot be spectators this time around, for sure. I mean, we've learned the lesson from the past. Uh, so we cannot be spectators of this revolution. And, I said, and, and I, as I said, the time is now. We don't have much time. So we really need to work on this strategy. On top of this strategy, the African Minerals Development Center is uh, uh, on the verge of creating also what we call an African Green Minerals Observatory. What would that observatory do? First of all, mapping. As I said, we really need our own geological uh, mining information system. We need to know where is what, and not just what USGS, US Geological Survey tells us, but exactly what, what is it that we have. We need to map our green minerals. The second one would be to track who is investing? China is the biggest investor, but who else is investing? Others are coming in. There's a rush. I think somebody used the word rush, rush to minerals. Uh, it's like the new oil. And, and uh, uh, Thomas mentioned that there's a geopolitical importance to that. We could be power, power, power makers because we, it, it's a powerful, the power is like oil now. The green minerals are like oil. So we need to track who are a major investment, where they're coming from and how, what impact and how can Africans invest in those as well? What are the, why are they not investing? We know what they, why we are Africans are not investing it's because there's lack of capital. How can we leverage the value of these minerals to, for instance, have the stock markets, uh, leverage them with the stock market and have some kind of a guarantee that just like the others, uh, the Australians of this world do. So this kind of uh, tracking and also tracking who's doing value addition. Um, South Africa is doing some value addition, um, uh, Zambia to some extent, and others. What is it that they're doing uh, that can be peer learned? Or what is it? We track value addition, what are their policies? What incentives did they give? That, that kind of thing, really making sure that uh, value addition is at the core and also tracking the policy and regulatory frameworks that enable value addition and what worked in manufacturing as well. And basically looking at uh, a forecasting and futures for these green minerals, where we are going. Uh, and I think it, it can be done in Africa. They do it in other regions. Europe does it, US does it, but you know, we have to be bold enough to also do it and, and really strategize for our green minerals. So that would be my sub submission today. Thank you. Fantastic submissions from you there, Dr. Marit. Um, very, very succinct recommendations. Um, one observation there, of course, being the green and strategic minerals versus the critical minerals uh, conversation. Um, it does look like um, there will be need for robust industrialization strategies for Africa to take part, to benefit um, as, as it should from the critical minerals deposits. Um, and, and it also looks like this conversation brings to the fore the African mining region um, that you alluded to, Dr. Uh, Ma Marit. I wonder, in view of, because you did highlight some examples, such as the battery precursor uh, production in DRC, um, in terms of the time frame, because I think this um, conversation on strategic minerals versus critical minerals and the urgency involved in the energy transition, it looks to me as if it presents you know, different, two different ways of looking at things in terms of how urgently the energy transition needs to be undertaken. Do you think, uh, Marit, sorry to come back to you again on this, um, as we look towards the energy transition, which must be now, will there be time for Africa to develop, you know, to take up these recommendations that you make uh, to go industrial? Will there really be time for Africa to do this? 
or the rush is likely to push Africa into again being an exporter of raw materials instead, which you know would translate into inequitable benefits uh, from the minerals. Is there a time? Uh, that's a very good question and a complex one. To, uh, we, as I said, there's no time, but as, as we say, it's about prioritization and it's about being bold about it. And if uh, the DRC precursor plant can be done in very few weeks, a uh, month, I mean, it's going to start production in, uh, I, I'm, I'm not sure, but it's the, the premier pierre, as we say, the first, uh, uh, the first stone is going to be done quickly because they, they were able to garner support. There was strong political will. There was uh, uh, financing coming because, you know, the, so it can be done. But as I said, it has to be really, really strong political will and, and a rush to do it as well. Um, so I am on the optimistic side of things. So I, but I really think that it can be done. Uh, and if governments and come, and uh, also the private sector is important also in that, in that, in that part. So if they believe that, you know, they can do that, uh, uh, DRC and Zambia are set, are on the verge of setting up this uh, special economic zones to attract uh, this investment. But of, of course, again, we don't want to go through that, uh, exporting role. So though there are incentives of, but it's carefully done. It's not a, a repeat of uh, tax holidays and all, all the things that we really have to make sure that even those special economic zones are beneficial to the to the region. And now we, uh, it's DRC Zambia, but that, that model can be replicated elsewhere. So I am on the optimist side and say that it can be done. Thank you. Thank you very much. It can be done. So at this moment in time, we will open our lines to participants who have joined us online. Um, there is a lot of discussion going on in the chat. I hope that our panelists can as well be able to see the comments that are coming through. Some pessimistic, some on the positive side of things. Um, I, I hope that if there are any questions for you, you can pick on our dear panelists and then there'll be time to report, uh, to, to uh, give some responses to those questions. Are there any hands, any of our participants that would like to keep it brief, please, when you are picked to submit, kindly keep it brief. Um, Theo, would you help me on our picking of hands? Um, in the next 10 minutes, we'll pick some hands and then uh, we'll go back to the next round of discussions. So it's open, uh, open game. Can I comment before the start, a small comment? Yes, kindly keep very brief. You will have another chance to speak again. Keep, yeah, keep yeah. My, my yeah. comment is that uh, what uh, the expert from the center is saying, uh, I remember when I was commissioner for Minos, we, we were involved in harmonization of. Sorry, I've lost you a bit there. Um, can you hear me, Dr. Kafumu? So sorry, I, but we will come back to you. If you can hear me, um, we will come back to you. Um, let, let's pick hands from the participants who have joined us online. And again, this discussion is going on on social media as well. We have a, a hand of being Rod COP27. Um, let's see if we have any hands um, to pick here. Please, if I pick you, kindly introduce yourself and keep it brief. Uh, let's hear from you, Paul Odokara. Keep it brief. Paul, can you hear me? I picked your hand. You should be able to speak now. Okay, yeah. Good morning from Abuja, Nigeria. Hello, can Good you hear morning. me? Okay. Please, very well, yeah. proceed. Okay, yeah. I want to talk uh, with respect to the presentations and um, of the critical minerals, uh, strategic minerals in Africa. The issue is that um, just like oil, we, the African leaders need to be very, very serious with exploration and need to um, attract investments, local investment to develop local content in the exploration of uh, these critical minerals. I wanna use the example of uh, my own country, Nigeria, where oil was uh, discovered in 1956. And up to this moment, uh, we don't have refineries to 
to be able to refine oil and we have to resort to importing at very high cost and detriment of the population. So such a thing will also happen to Africa countries if we don't uh, develop local content and attract investment locally to be able to explore these minerals so that we have a, a value addition uh, will be sourced here locally. And again, the uh, link to exploration is the mitigation of the environmental impacts. Just like oil um, in so, so many parts of the country and the continent, the uh, impact of uh, um, environmental exploration was left. So we have African, African leaders also need to develop strategy to mitigate the effect of exploration of these minerals because they, they will uh, be very harmful uh, if uh, the environment is not safe for, for the citizens then during this uh, exploration. Thank you. Thank you very much, Paul, uh, for echoing some of the points that were made, but also emphasizing that uh, mining itself can also have an environmental footprint that we need to avoid, uh, not jump from the frying pan to the fire proper, like they say in some quarters. Um, we shall now hear from you, um, Abdul Karim Muhammad. Oh, <clears throat> thank you very much, um, Gerald. And uh, I think this has been very useful um, uh, presentations by all the presenters. I, I think uh, it goes back to the same question of uh, why do we always have to play catch up as a, as a continent that is being endowed with all these uh, resources? Um, and I think this puts a lot of responsibility on the um, Dr. Mary's uh, your secretariat. Um, I think we need to double up. Uh, I will not say this is a emerging uh, opportunity. The opportunity already exists. We know where the world is moving the direction in which the world is moving now. Renewable energy is the future. Uh, we are talking about um, um, electronic, uh, electric cars, uh, all these electronic devices that we have become so dependent and addicted to. It tells you there is no going back. And very soon, there's going to be, a, there's a technology shift seriously ongoing. Uh, internal combustion engines will become a thing of the past. In, 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 in a few years. And if we are not careful, we will be caught uh, on our ways once again, even though it is happening right before our eyes. So for me, it is a very critical issue. It borders on our very, uh, what I say, existence. And it, it even boils down to our, uh, I would say, national security uh, or continental security uh, for that matter. Now, uh, may I know what uh, strategies are underway to develop a critical mass of, of, um, of expertise across the continent to help in this drive? I mean, I listened to the, your presentation and I was excited developing our own database so that we are not dependent on, say, U.S. geological surveys and, and the rest. But what strategies are we getting the continental body committing resources enough to it what from your from where you sit how would you assess the level of commitment because you mentioned that you mentioned uh, what do you call it uh, uh, political uh, will uh, and all that bold industrial policy uh, those are wonderful ideas and these are the things that will propel us to um, yes uh, the impetus that we we've seen uh, african leaders driving the african free trade continental uh, African Continental uh, Free Trade Agreement is beautiful, but beyond that, what will you, what do you think um, are these practical steps we need so that we tap into this energy and we will not, as always, come back and and cry as victims. Yeah. Thank you very much, uh, Abdul Karim. Of course, reiterating that this is in a way an industrial revolution. Um, in how ready are we to develop a critical mass of uh, technical capacity on the continent? Um, I will proceed and pick your hand, um, Keta Kandriana, if you are able to. Yeah. Thank you, Chair, and uh, thanks to all the presenters for this brilliant session. Uh, I'm Keta Kandriana Fitzon from uh, 
the Publish What You Pay Coalition in Madagascar and also the Executive Director for Transparency International here. Uh, I would like just to emphasize the need. This is a real emergency in my sense that we as African countries build a common strategy on the road to COP27 because I have the feeling that on the discussions on climate change, there is a little room really uh, serving this discussion on energy transition, just energy transition. And one topic that would also be meaningful is the transparency of financial flows uh, allotted to this just transition in Africa, because climate change is a big trend nowadays, and I think that it will be going uh, forward in the next years, but, and this will generate a lot of aid for African countries. But if we are not sure that this uh, international aid or those, those funds will be used in a right way by governments, we all know how it works, then uh, all of this will be a loss. So we need a strategy and we need mechanisms for you know, um, anticipating this growing trend uh, in the continent. So we should have a statement or joint strategy or whatever to be presented at COP 37, we have the advantage that it is an African COP. And uh, uh, I'm really pushing everyone who will have the chance to attend this COP to, to push for those topics and ask for general commitment for Roma world governments mm. on a transparent um, uh, management of such funds. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, too, for your submissions. We'll have our quicker last hand before I read out a few questions from chat. Um, to you, Christine Ndao. Um, hello, uh, everyone, and thank you so much to all the presenters. Um, my question is, uh, in, in light of the energy transition discussions, do you foresee any hesitation by oil producing countries and, and companies that are reluctant to leave resources in the ground? And how would we deal with such a situation? Thank you. Thank you for keeping it brief. Um, I, I, I'm very sure that our esteemed part, uh, panelists have picked on some of those questions. I'll proceed to read on a few. Um, one question from you, Sam, if I read it well, is asking about developing uh, capacity um sorry just a moment yeah um are we no sorry from you donald are we likely to see surging state capture as extractive corporates who invest more in becoming comfortable bedfellow with the african bedfellows with the african government the other question I, I think i guess this goes to all of us perhaps if um if uh, dr marit um, and you peter having been in government will have something to say about this um, audience kindly di direct questions to specific panelists because that would make our job even easier. Um, the, there are questions that are again about who we develop, who we invest and develop in this, um, um, you know, building capacity for Africa um, to do geological mapping and all the technical work that we need to do, who's going to invest the money and who is going to carry that forward. Um, there's a lot of appreciation to our panelists there that I need not read through. So panelists, um, if you have any specific questions that uh, you want to respond to very quickly, um, and this is open now, kind, kindly um, I give, keep it short and respond to any specific questions that you may want to respond to now. It's open game. Yes. Okay, uh, maybe I can uh, respond to uh, a question and comment by, I think somebody, someone called Abdul, um, um, yeah, he was making the point that, you know, we are always playing catch up uh, and uh, we need to have a continental strategy, which is very fair. And that's exactly what uh, uh, the African Minerals Development Center is, is doing. And then he also answered his own question by asking, are we having a critical mass of expertise? Um, and if there is, a, he was asking if there is a, a how do you say, like, like the FCFTA, if there was a momentum for, for this. Um, 
because this is a frank discussion, we have to say that there is no, uh, actually no momentum for this. And he was asking you African countries are willing to commit. Um, so the African Minerals Development Center as it is now is, a, is an interim secretariat. Uh, it's still not a full-fledged uh, specialized agency. We need 15 ratifications from our member states and we only have three for now. Um, so it's still not, <laughs> to answer his question about is there a drive for, um, uh, for, from the African continent. So basically right now, our uh, secretariat depends on funds uh, from uh, UNDP uh, and um, uh, the European Union, just to put things in perspective and the OACPS, Organization of African uh, and Pacific States. So to answer the question, is there a drive by African countries? I think we by having by showing them value if we have this database that we're talking about if you have this observatory that we're talking about and if we influence policies our strategy is that they will see the need for this and they will create the momentum and there will be ratification and hopefully they will also invest in in a sense in uh, even member states contribution to the african minerals development center which right now is is non-existent so to answer the question is no at this point there's no real commitment that we are working on it and we need everyone. Uh, we recently had a strategic partners um, meeting with all our African Development Bank, uh, Africa Legal Support Facility, UNDP, ECA, all of those who are involved in, uh, all also the Regional Economic Commission's very important role, uh, SADC, um, uh, ECAS and others, so that we really create that momentum and, and leverage on our competitive advantages and see how we can come up with a with an African strategy, uh, so to speak. Even sometimes, if we don't have the resources, but we leverage on each other and you know work on Africa. So that's the strategy we are building. And to answer his question on the critical mass of expertise, uh, we are resuscitating a program that's called the African Mineral Skills Initiative, uh, which was um, uh, first. Uh, uh, developed by the first phase of the AMDC, but it didn't take off at the time. Perhaps uh, there was a moment was not there, but we're, we're reviving it. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's critical mass with, with expertise, with uh, collaboration with, of course, governments and institutions such as AMDC and the private sector and academia. Why private sector? Because they are the ones who need the skills. So and academia, they are the ones who teach, they're learning institutions. So. A, a tripartite kind of, or a four uh, uh, kind of to see to uh, see what are the needs, and you know, and 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 then develop the skills needed, not uh, and match uh, those two. Of course, it has to be very African oriented, so that there's no. We we make sure that the the value is retained in 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 Africa. So we're we're also reviving that, and we are hoping that we'll create this critical mass of expertise. So I'll end, I'll end here. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, Thomas, do you have any quick questions that you would like to respond to now? Um, thank you. Yeah, lots of interesting questions. Um, so hard to choose from them. Um, but I guess I'll first just uh, quickly go to the point around um, sort of how, how do we sort of stop Africa from just ending up exporting all of its, its raw materials? Um, and on that, I think I'd, I'd like to sort of note that I think Africa will have to export some of its minerals. Um, as, as Dr. Marriott pointed out, um, Africa is rich in minerals, but very poor in financial capital. So the reality is financial capital will have to come from abroad. Um, and it's unlikely that um, that capital will uh, will be invested if there isn't some export overseas, particularly given that's where currently the larger markets um, with, with higher prices are. So that's what's going to um, attract the investment. Having said that, I think it is important as countries are trying to attract investment now and striking deals with companies to have in mind that they're to have the plan to establish uh, downstream value chains in mind now. Um, so they can structure deals that also allow them access to some of those minerals for, their, uh, for the regional, regional value chain. For example, 
governments could be looking at um, a similar arrangement to what we have in the oil and gas sector, where there is some sort of production sharing arrangement. There's lots of different ways that it could be done, but um, yeah, we need to be thinking about this now uh, to make sure that, that the value chains are, are feasible in the in the future. Um, but on the the, sort of the the financing point, um, though Africa is does have limited financial capital and um there will have to be a, a, a reasonable amount of private uh, investment from overseas to get these mines developed i think africa does have the potential to get more financial capital for itself given the importance of transition minerals right now and i think this is one of the messages it should be taking to to cop that these minerals are critical for the world's transition um and we uh, so one, we need finance to actually uh, get them out of the ground, developed, um, but also that good governance and Africa benefiting from these minerals come hand in hand with these minerals being available for the energy transition. Um, countries will not, as, as this discussion shows, countries will are not willing to uh, let all of their minerals go overseas. They uh, do need a good deal from them. And therefore, the world has um, a need to ensure that African countries benefit. Um, that includes climate finance that can be used in lots of different ways to, once we start thinking about the need for Africa to get a, a, a good deal, we're talking about building up capacity in tax administration, we're talking about investing in um, skills uh, and sort of vocational training centers. Um, we could also be talking about investing in that in that value value chain downstream. Um, so I think one of the messages that Africa should be going to cop with is: um, you want our minerals, you can have some of them, um, but you need to be providing a lot of support and acknowledging the need for Africa to benefit um, to to get them. Thank, thank you so much, Thomas. Africa will have to export some of its minerals. Of course, the world, the globe is an interdependent uh, space, so that might be need to export some, maybe not. I think from the work that Tax uh, Justice Network Africa has done, and also from the highlights that our colleague Chennai uh, shared at the start, one of the reasons she highlighted why Africa lacks finance is because of illicit financial flows. So I'm asking myself, can we on one hand stay illicit financial flow? Um, that would, you know, capacitate Africa to be able to invest in some of these structures. There are perhaps um, questions beyond the scope of today's conversation um, that may go into why is it that Africa lacks the finance to develop its own minerals, but perhaps those are beyond uh, the scope of today's discussion. Dr. Peter Kafumu, there were a lot of comments um, on your presentation about Tanzania and uh, some requests for, for your material as well. Um, I hope you can hear me well. What so far stands out for you um, from the comments and questions that have come through that you'd like to respond to uh, in one minute? Um, I think you are in mute. I think you have muted your voice. Yeah, I was saying that uh, for me, and with all those questions, I would reiterate my, my, my call that the center is an important vehicle for Africa to move. And, but it must uh, make sure that countries at the, the, the country level, they wake up and start participating in this activity. Otherwise, we'll be talking on the, at the top level, the African Union at the center, but after the countries themselves, there's no political will, nobody is actually trying to to, to, to push projects. So an example would be the geological surveys, for example. Geological surveys, each country have a geological survey and they have a lot of data. I worked at the geological survey when I started as a geologist for, for 20 years. We have a lot of data, geological data in, in at the geological survey of Tanzania. But the problem is, as you said, finances. And so the data lies Behind, behind somewhere in the, the backyard. So the center is an important area where we can push these things up and then 
uh, let the world see this information. And we can use this as a leverage you know, to, to, to get uh, some projects. And the last point is the export orientation of our extraction of minerals is a bad thing for us. In Tanzania now, as I said, I gave you some projects. All those projects are aiming at taking minerals outside, taking minerals into the, the, the industrial world and then leave Tanzania with maybe the finances, the taxes and on, on those also. So we need actually to incentivize Tanzania as a government to make laws and, and, and policies that would require investors to negotiate a, 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 a maybe 25, 75 uh, takeoff. 75 will take it, 25 will need for local content. I'll give you an example, which I, 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 I was part of a director, I was a director in one company called Natural called Graphite in the southern part of Tanzania. We had negotiated with the government that we would take 25% of graphite and establish a battery uh, industry here at, at, at the export processing zone. So we make batteries in Tanzania, sell them local, and then export them. And then the 75 go to the hospital. So this is so important that we should actually go to the, to the countries and make the, the, make the projects work locally. If we talk at the low, at the high level, we won't manage to, to do this. Uh, Thank you so uh, much. Um, yeah, let's go. Skills development is another another important thing. As as the center said, we need to make skills in these countries for local content. Otherwise, if we don't have the skills, and the skills are at two levels: one, academic knowledge-based skills, but the vocational skills are also important. So you need to work with the private sector, the mine companies themselves, so that we can create technicians and so on in this industry so that we can, the local content works there. Asante, uh, thank, thank you so much. I will read out two comments on chat before I can pick uh, another round of hands from the audience. Uh, one comment from you, uh, Davis Osoro. He appreciates you, Thomas, uh, for the uh, insightful presentation and also reiterates the importance of extraction, extraction finance, um, the fact that my, the most of the funds uh, will come from outside of the continent, but then poses the question, do we know if this is a bad thing or a good thing? Um, I guess your guess is as good as mine there. Do we know if the fact that the financing comes from outside Africa is a bad thing or a good thing? Um, another comment on chat there asking, does Africa really need to move at the same pace with the rest of the world in this energy transition uh, discussion? Or can we afford to slow down ourselves and pace ourselves to be able to harness our natural resources? Um, one of the questions is there coming from, um, from our chat. Yeah, massive, massive interest and questions there coming um, through our chat, uh, chat box here. I would like to know if there are any, any other hands, uh, final round of uh, questions uh, by hand uh, that we can pick in the next eight minutes before our panelists go to giving us uh, closing remarks. Um, I see some hands, yes. Um, sorry, I am trying to pick um, a few additional hands. Now, um, I guess we'll, Thomas, do you know from where you sit if it's a bad or good thing that most of the finance is coming from outside the continent, from where you sit as you? I mean, I think what we can say with confidence is that um, the mining sector hasn't delivered the outcomes that um, countries were expecting over the last few, few decades. Um, and most of that financing has come from overseas. Um, I think there is some correlation in that um, domestic companies are more likely to um, both be willing to, but also able to um, come more integrated into, into domestic economies. Um, but I think there are lots of lessons we've learned from the past, well, from the past commodity boom, for example, that can be put into place to uh, improve those outcomes, even if um, a significant amount of the financing right. going forwards will still come from, from overseas. Right. Um, I pick one more hand. Thank you so much, Thomas. I'll pick one more hand from you, Nsama Chikwanka. Please go ahead. Keep it brief. 
Sure, thanks. Uh, this has really been <clears throat> a great um, webinar, very informative. Uh, I think I want to add also provocative. And I, I just shared a, a, a comment in chat that we really need to, we need a revolution. Because if we continue, look, I know, I know <laughs> we can't expect the current economic models to deliver any change in the time frame that we are talking about or we are working with. Uh, panelists have talked about the IMF, the WebIOS, the academia. I mean, who controls those institutions? Sometimes we, I mean, I, 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 I get baffled because we know the undertones. We know who really is playing the tunes, but we still want to go back and use the same institutions that have kept us in the same space that we've been. Can we engage in exploring different ways to really re-engage mm -hmm. for maximum benefits? Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, how far are we, willing to, are we willing to go in terms of challenging the current economic model that's responsible for keeping us uh, where we are at in terms of uh, harnessing the natural resources? How far are we willing to go? Very good question there. Um, um, I think, I think uh, I don't know, I think this is open game again, but since we are talking Africa continent-wide, I think who is best placed to respond to this than somebody that sits at the helm um, of the body that's charged with uh, spearheading the Africa mining region. So perhaps you'll give us some comments there on the economic model and what it is we need to, to do about that. And then after that, we will go into panelists giving our, our final parting shots. Um, uh, please tailor them to to be you know to guide us towards uh, what we take into COP27. But before that, to you, Dr. Uh, Marit, how far are we willing to go? What options do we have in terms of the institutions that can push us forward? Thank you very much for that. Um, uh, I don't think it's very provocative. Actually, we've been saying this for a long time that we need an African revolution, and and uh, we we can see that the economic models of the past or still ongoing are not really benefiting us. That's the, the reason why actually the Africa mining vision was uh, developed in 2009. We are 13 years into the Africa mining vision and you know uh, it has we have made some strides but uh, where are we today? So we know that we need to uh, this comparative advantage, uh, Adam Smith, uh, you know, is, is if we follow that path, uh, uh, we'll be uh, supplying uh, raw materials for the uh, under this comparative advantage, it will keep, it will keep us where we are. So that economic model definitely doesn't work. So that's why we're trying to move up the ladder and go to the value chains. Are we doing it um, successfully? Is another question. Uh, and as uh, uh, Mr. Uh, Insama uh, mentioned, there is a lot of geopolitical, geo uh, geopolitical and uh, political economy issues there. Uh, um, basically, because of the past, uh, we cannot uh, deny that you know the colonial past made sure that you know the uh, it was an enclave. Basically, um, you know the explore, uh, explored and and going from uh, the site where it's explored to directly to the port and shifted to the uh, co uh, to the Western countries, the Europeans at the time. So that model. Uh, was was not easy to break, and uh, so that's that. The, there's a remaining of that path that are still holding us, but there is still um, uh, there is some type of wake up call that we we have had in the in the. That's why A and V was there, and I have to say, civil society was very much involved in the in the movement towards the creation of the African mineral uh, mining vision, and I know some of the uh, of or some of these. Um, uh, civil society are, are part of the organizers here, and I really want to mention that it's, it became it's, it was a momentum that was started back then in 2009 during commodities boom and uh, realizing that you know Africa the people were not benefiting and that's why this movement started and that was a mini revolution at least from the mindsets part. Did we achieve it on the ground? That's another question. That then I, I think the nitty gritty is that really to ensure that these barriers. For, for achieving this, we realize that we need to do that, but there are real big barriers, the silos, the capacities, uh, the models, and also the mindsets again, and the boldness of it. And, uh, you know, we really need some, uh, 
the mindset revolution, basically, more than the real revolution. That's what we need. And then we, we put, we make sure that we also have the capital and the capacity, the two Cs. Uh, I think that's, or, and, and I saw, sorry, I, I saw in the, in the chat, somebody was saying the MDC should be more visible. And I, I, I agree, and it's up to all of us, because I, as I said, AMDC was born out of a, a mo movement created by all. <laughs> so I think it's, it's all of us who should be uh, involved in making sure that AMDC is visible. And when we do that, when we create the momentum, that's when you know, all these ratifications will start coming and we'll have the momentum. So it's all of us. AMDC is all of us. This is the message that I want to say. Thank you. Yes, it is all of us. And perhaps for those of us who are in the civil society space, this really presents an opportunity to try, to try and work with the MDC as much as we can. If you are from academia, civil society, think tanks, working with the MDC to make sure the aspirations of the African mining vision are realized um, and, and, and adjusted where they need to be. Um, yes, um, I think we have one more, uh, no, not one more comment. We will go back to our panelists. Um, it's uh, at the mark now, but we will have a 15 more minutes for closing remarks. And I will request that um, our panelists give the closing remarks in form of uh, recommendations, in form of what Africa could take potentially to the COP27 process, um, you know, on critical minerals and how Africa can live with this in the era of the energy transition. I'll start with you, um, Thomas. Uh, I know you already said a lot, you presented very insightful, um, you know, research there. What would you, in summary, say Africa could take into COP27 regarding how we had a sound natural resources um, in five minutes? Thank you, and I'll, I'll try and take less time than that because I think um, my recommendations are quite, quite simple. Um, one is for Africa to benefit from this opportunity, regional co air coordination is absolutely key. I think that's been uh, highlighted a lot during this call. Obviously, there are lots of challenges with that, but um, these they can be overcome, particularly with um, the growing sort of strength of of um, of the AU, AFDB, uh, AMDC, ANRC. I'm I'm hopeful that we uh, we can see um, that regional coordination start to materialise, um, and it needs to if Africa is going to to benefit from from this opportunity. Um, in terms of what um, what Africa should go to COP saying, I think as I as I said earlier, I think the key message has to be um, if the world uh, if the world is going to transition, it needs Africa's minerals, um, and for uh, for it to get Africa's some of Africa's minerals, it needs to ensure that Africa also benefits from them in the ways we've been discussing. That includes establishing uh, value chains um, in the in the region, um, and explore sort of innovative solutions for for making that happen, including through climate finance. Um, though obviously, there needs to be a shift in the rich countries' approach to climate finance, given the the commitments they've already made have, have, have yet to be met, um, but it's it's now on the on the rich countries to to make make that difference. Thank you, thank you so much. Um, Af the world needs Africa's minerals, and perhaps in my own remarks, I would add that the world needs the transition together with Africa. Um, um, that that's I think going to be an equitable transition, in my own view. Um, to you, Dr. Peter Kafumu. Having worked in government, and in industry, as we have learned, um, and, and the consultants now, what do you think would be the key takeaways that Africa could go into COP27 with? Um, I, I, I don't think I have a comment on that. Okay. Maybe I would say that uh, uh, we need to... Uh, start working on, on now. Africa must work now, must start now. There's no delay uh, in terms of, because if we don't work now, we'll be left out and our resources like coal, gas and oil will be valueless at the time by, by 2050. If the world moves there, Africa should work together now. 
And, uh, and probably the last point would be that Africa should be one block. And if you read the, the charter, the OU charter, it was very clear that we, we need to decolonize and then unite and become one economic block. Still, we need that motion is very important. The center could work. We should uh, incentivize countries now to make laws and, and, and policies that look at energy transition and critical minerals. And then the center would harmonize these laws to make one block. And then we will, will be fine as, as we, we participate. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Doctor. I'm making a point that the time is now. We don't want to wake up in 2050 and we are complaining about the great energy transition that uh, eroded Africa. So that's a very good uh, observation. I'll hand it over to you, Dr. Marit, uh, to make your closing, uh, you know, your parting shots. Uh, thank you. I will re repeat what, I, what, I've, what I've said. Um, and I, I concur with both uh, Thomas and uh, Dr. Peter on this. Uh, energy transition requires this strategic green minerals that Africa has. So basically, this time around, it has to be on Africa's terms. That's the, the message that we want to bring to the COP. And to do that, um, you know, uh, we will have to ensure that, you know, we get the best out of these green minerals. Value addition is our key and uh, making sure that, uh, you know, it's not export to draw. So that's the main message. And the second one, uh, we, again, I'll, I'll talk about this being bold and uh, having a strong political will at the regional, as, as a regional block as well, as regional and African continental, which is some, this is another issue. I mean, there are other issues that uh, uh, African countries uh, do bilateral with, uh, with each, but I think on this green minerals part, because that's where we are, what we are discussing, it's, uh, we should really go uh, with the same um, view that, you know, we need that message of, you know, we need to have these bold initiatives such as this battery precursor in, in, in DRC, and all that, that value addition is the key for our green minerals for the future. So that's, I think, should be. And the third one, is, again, uh, is about the now, uh, Dr. Peter mentioned. We don't have time. There's a race, as I mentioned. So we have to, we don't have the luxury of time, so we have to do it now. And so uh, as AMDC, we'll, we'll, uh, we'll do uh, what we can. And that's why we need to come together and we can be the central repository of a lot of uh, these issues. Issues. So uh, that's what we aspire, and uh, that's the message that we are we are taking to the we we think should be taken to the COP twenty seven. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Mari. They are pointing out some opportunities um, that are of interest to some of us. Um, you know, green Africa Green Minerals Strategy Development of the Observatory, and all these. I, I know that a couple of us will be in touch with you about you know, what we can potentially add as value to set the initiatives that you're spearheading. Thank you all our panelists. Thank you participants who joined us from wherever you joined us. Um, I, on my part, I am signing out and then I'll have Moses give us the closing remarks. I have been your moderator, Gerald Biarugaba. I work with Oxfam as a regional advisor on extractive industries and fiscal justice for the Horn of Eastern Central Africa region. It's been an absolute honor and pleasure having you. Um, and I look forward to more engagements. Over to you, Moses, to close this officially. Thank you indeed. Uh, thank you so much, Gerard, for what really looks like one of the best and very bright brand webinars that we have had so far. And I want to thank our distinguished panelists for being so resourceful, but also most importantly, thank our participants who have been loyal with us since March when we started this series of seminars, of webinars. We want to thank you uh, that you have shared uh, your contributions. And we hope that this will go into the history of the world when it's told many years to come that we did something. We want to thank you. Uh, this was the seventh webinar, uh, bringing almost towards the conclusion or the tail end of the series of webinars that we've been holding as a road to COP27. We will be discussing among us ourselves in terms of how we move forward, whether we shall be having another webinar or not, but we plan to have a concluding webinar where we shall try to sum up all the issues that have come across the value chain, but also across the different discussions that we've had on oil or renewable energy, and of course, right now on critical minerals. 
we want to thank you once again uh, for being dedicated with us. We will definitely share the recordings. The previous ones are available and you will be able to share the recordings from this uh, webinar as well. With those parting remarks, we want to thank you so much and wish you a pleasant, pleasant, pleasant day. Bye everyone. For those who are on, could you put on your video and say bye to us? <laughs> bye.